This is the clerk with a courtesy announcement. The meeting is now live on the internet and recording. Good afternoon, Leland. Would you like to do a quick mic check? Can you hear me? I can, thank you. Okay, thank you. And good afternoon, Greg. Would you like to do a quick mic check and perhaps adjust your camera? Yeah. Yes, yes. You are good to go. Thank you. Thank you. And Maricela, can we do a quick mic check? Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon already. Maricela with Siren. Thank you. And we, can we do a quick mic check? Hi, this is we. Thank you. And Kavita, can we do a quick mic check? Good afternoon. Thanks. And good afternoon, Supervisor Chavez. I see you've joined. Good afternoon, Richard. Would you like to do a quick mic check? Good afternoon. Thank you. Test. Good afternoon, Marianne. Can we do a quick mic check? Yes. Thank Good afternoon. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Thanks. I can. And Alan, it looks like you joined. Would you like to do a quick mic check? Yes. Hello, everybody. El Washburn, Deputy Chief, San Jose PD. Thank you. I'm zooming from my car, so forgive my background. No worries. You're loud and clear. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon or good morning. Good. Oh, good. My sound works. Hi, yeah. buddy. Do you want to test your screen share or anything, buddy? As soon as I can get that button to work. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Jay. Would you like to do a quick mic check? Good afternoon. This is Jay. Happy to see everyone. You're loud and clear. Thank you. And Maha, can we do a mic check? And how about Lily? I see you've joined. Can we do a quick mic check? Hi. Thank you. Did you want me to do a, a, a um, mic check as well? Yes, thank you. And you're loud and clear. Thanks.
Jay, there are two of you in the room. Can we please clarify who's who? Jay Boyarski. Deputy DA Aaron West, who is in charge of hate crime prosecutions for our office, is using my link. Okay. Oh, I'm happy to not use your link if you if that's a problem. It's not a problem for me. Is it a problem for uh, the clerk's office? Prefers that. Office. Yeah, we prefer that your link not be shared. Um, if you can come in as attendee with how you'd like your name to appear, we can promote you. How do you? Can you so send you, Aaron you, a regular link, or how does Aaron do that? Link. I I can also just rename rename her. How would I'm sorry? Can you? Is it um, e -R -I -N? However, however you'd like to do it, it's E R I N West. And just a quick title for you. Uh, Deputy District Attorney. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Should I log out? Nope. You are going to be good to go in just a second. Thank you for helping. No problem. Thanks. Thank you. We'll use the public uh, link in the future. You bet. Thank you. Yeah, and, and one thing, and I'll, I'll uh, as we start the meeting, I'll just say that if um, if you're on the task force, it, we would like you to be on the panelist side. If you're not on the task force, we would like you to be on the attendee side, and only because of the sheer number of you that there are, it makes it easier for the clerk and I to manage the meeting. So, um, so anyway, so we'll remind people, please don't share your link, and when we send it out again, we'll remind folks of that, and also send a link for participant or attendees. I know some of us have staff on too, and you know we, we can ask our staff to be on the attendee side. All right, we'll just give a minute. I, I my uh, computer wouldn't actually link in today, so log on today. So I'm feeling a lot of compassion for other people who are technically disadvantaged as I am. So we'll let people join on. And I'm glad to see so many of you with us today. So I'm going to begin um, by calling our meeting to order for the Hate Crimes Task Force on this uh, April 30th. And I'm going to ask if, uh, if I can for the clerk to call the roll. Thank you, Co-Chairperson Chavez. Here. Co-Chairperson Esparza. Here. Member Lee. We'll come back. Member Boyarski. Here. Present, thank you. Member Smith? Here. Present, thank you. Uh, Member O'Neill? On behalf of Molly O'Neill. Thank you, David. Uh, Member Smith? Absent. Member Narayan? Here. Thank you. Member No? Here. Thank you. Member Washburn? I'm here. Thank you. Member Dewan. Present. Thank you. Member Armaline. Present. Thank you. Member Appel. Here. Thank you. Member Yeager. Here. Member Estramera. Here. Thank you. Member El Janati. I think I heard you there. Thank you, and Member Conda. Here. Thank you, you have a quorum. Thank you so much. And I wanna just remind everyone that the, um, the reason we have the smaller group is mostly to make sure we have a quorum, but all of you are uh, members. So to make sure that we, uh, that we just acknowledge that. I'm gonna go to see if there are any members of the public who would like to speak to an item that is not on the agenda, but within the purview of this committee. And I see no raised hands from the public. So I'm gonna go back uh, to us for consent. I don't think we have- Madam Chair, I did have one hand go up right. Ah, oh, great, thank you. Um, would you like two minutes? Yes, please, thank you. Thank you. Our first speaker is Irvish. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute as soon as the timer is visible. You'll have two minutes to speak. Thank you very much. Um, sorry for the delay on the timer. Please go ahead. 
Thank you very much. I want to thank you uh, to all the commissioners uh, and all the county councils uh, for, uh, for, for, for the opportunity to speak as a public speaker. Uh, uh, you know, with regards to the, uh, the committee stand on a hate crime commission. As a part of a legislative council digest, what is most important is to implement and to keep up with the hate crimes that is happening in the county of Santa Clara. Since past one year, there has been a lot many California legislative bills that has been introduced in order to address the law enforcement with the hate crimes. One of the bill is the AB 57. AB 57 that addresses the commission on the peace officers and providing the training to develop the guideline and course instruction for and training for the law enforcement officers addressing specifically the hate crimes. Also, there has been an AB 837 that has been established as well, which requires the amendment to the existing law to define the criminal act committed in a whole part and allow the peace officer to evaluate the frequency of the methods that is required to be implemented as a part of a legislative council for the hate crimes. Both the bills has been, has been introduced in 2019 and the bill AB 57 that has been introduced on December 7, 2020. Both the bills are equally important to implement the, the targeting the hate crimes against a specific race, racial justice, in order to prevent, in order to prevent the hate crimes within the, uh, within the legislation. It is important that as a council to implement the bills and allow the lawmakers to implement the right set of a standard for the county. Thank you very much. That concludes our speakers. Great, thank you very much. And I wanted to just acknowledge that Dr. Smith is present for the clerk. Thank you. And um, so for our, um, any changes to the agenda, what I wanted to do, um, we don't have a uh, minutes from the last meeting, but what we do wanna ask if we can move item seven um, before item six, and if folks are okay with that, I don't think we need a motion on that. Right, Kavita? We're just gonna move two around. Yep, that's okay. All right, thank you. And um, Richard, you had your hand up? No? All right. So uh, just a couple things um, I wanted to just talk about with the agenda today, just as an overview. We're gonna receive a report from Congress member Rokana relating to outcomes from the anti-Asian Americans and Pacific Islander hate forum at approximately uh, 1215. And um, we're gonna consider recommendations from impacted communities relating to hate crimes. Uh, we have some reports that haven't been heard yet. So we're gonna go right to those and then we'll go to item seven, which is to discuss the um, and approve text of proposed resolution to the Board of Supervisors, re recommending additional law enforcement training. And then to item six, a report relating on the anti-racism community outreach and education, and then to item eight, which is a report re related to um, al alternate names for the hate crimes task force. We had some uh, folks who wanted to raise that as an issue. So um, let me see. All right, great. So with that, I'm gonna then, if that's okay with everybody, we're gonna go right over to begin item five. We'll come back to item four. But we're going to go to item five, um, which is uh, to receive some reports that we hadn't received at our previous meeting. And so um, they, there were a few groups who weren't able to present. So we're going to start with Lily from March for Our Lives. Um, each of our presenters is going to have about three minutes like everybody else did. And please just say next slide when you need your slide um, next slided. So we're going to hear um, from uh, Lily followed by uh, Marcella Gutierrez with Siren and Myra with Luna. Perfect. Am I all set to start? You are. Okay, awesome. So hi, my name is Lily. I am a uh, sophomore at St. Francis High School and I'm here today representing March for Our Lives San Jose um, to talk about how bias related incidents are showing up in schools. I might talk a little bit fast just because I want to get through everything. But um, yeah, so if you want to go to the next slide. 
Uh, so this is some data from the Southern Poverty Law Center about general bias related incidents in schools. I'm not going to talk too much about this just because I want to spend more time on the solution. But the main idea is that bias related incidents are happening in schools at an alarming rate. And if you want to go to the next slide again, little is being done by schools to discipline them. And so that's what the solution really focuses on is um, setting clear guidelines for how schools can discipline and effectively respond to bias related incidents. Sorry, my dog is barking in the background. Um, and if you want to go to the next slide. So I was able to conduct a quick survey of local high school students in the Santa Clara County, and it provided some really useful descriptive results. If you wanna to go to the next slide, it has them. Um, so the important thing here is that bias related incidents are still happening, even though we're in virtual school, I've seen it and other people have seen it. And a lot of these have been relating to um, Asian American identities and COVID-19. This is happening in the bigger world too, but it's really happening in the high school community. And if you wanna to go to the next slide again, um, this is more of the descriptive evidence, but I can sort of speak to it of how uh, bias related incidents are very much so normalized in a high school setting and jokes are made that should not be made at all. They aren't joking matters um, and people will find uh, diverse identities and pick them out as a laughing matter. And that's how most bias related incidents show up. Um, a lot of times it stems from ignorance and luckily schools are a place where people go to learn. So it's the best place to combat ignorance. Um, and if you wanna go to the next slide, the Department of Justice and Department of Education set models for um, creating safe spaces for identities in schools. And essentially it comes down to preventing planning and reflecting. So if you wanna go to the next slide again, um, I think the county as a whole can create a toolkit for hate prevention policies that set a clear guideline of what hate looks like, what will happen to a perpetrator of a bias related incident in school, um, support network for victims, and then also mandating empathy building anti bias curriculums, whether that be having actual class periods dedicated to what is a microaggression, here's how to take a stand against hate, or just in the core classes like English classes mandating diverse author selections or in chemistry mandating um, diverse presentations on frequently underrepresented identities in stem. Um, and then if you want to go to the reflect slide, I think it's two slides. Yeah, uh, I really want to emphasize the need for data. I know a lot of people talked about this last time, but more data on high school specifically in bias related incidents. There's a lot for college, not a lot for high school. So it would definitely be useful if we could mandate that data collection and share it. But yeah. Thank you, Lily. Well done. All right, Marcella. Welcome. Hi there, how are you? Um, thank you for having me, Maricela Gutierrez with SIREN, the Executive Director. And I did e add extra slides, but I'll skip over some slides in them so I can stay within the three minute mark. Um, just a little bit about um, SIREN, we're an uh, immigrant and refugee rights organization celebrating 35 years this year. Um, we work with immigrants across California and with offices in uh, Santa Clara County and in the Central Valley. Our, our strategies are a four-pronged model of immigration legal services, community organizing, civic engagement, and policy advocacy. Um, and we serve you know, immigrants from all over the world and really um, Latino, Asian American, API, uh, Sikh, and African communities. Next slide. Um, if you can skip to slide four, uh, the next slide after that, yes. Um, so just a little bit about the current climate that we are seeing <clears throat> for immigrants. Um, as we know, we've survived, we survived four years of one of the most cruelest um, presidents in the history of the US. Um, and as at least for the immigrant community, um, it was a, a time of being un, under immense um, defense. And we saw just a visible, visible emergence of anti-immigrant and white supremacy um, sentiment coming from the Trump administration and that started all the way from his election um, and it continues to remain as we saw what the hostile takeover that happened early this year in the White House and you know proud boy still um, showing up at different actions and events around the Central Valley Central Coast um, an increase in anti Asian American and AAPI harassment and violence since COVID-19 um, calling it the China virus, you know, um, and just different situations like that, that really um, attacked uh, Asian uh, American communities, AAPI communities. 
and just the model minority myth and that how that played out also for our um, API communities. And the ongoing Islamophobia, you know, exacerbated, exacerbated by post 9-11 backlash and the previous um, federal Muslim ban that was lifted under the Biden administration this year. Um, and then just the xenophobic political rhetoric um, that continues by elected officials and our candidates. We know that there's a lot of candidates that still continue to support that um, mentality and um, it continues within our, our funneling down into our communities. Next slide. The next slide just shows national data regarding immigrant and refugee communities. I'm not gonna go over each percentage, but I um, wanted to share that with the committee so you can look at that later. Next slide. Uh, I believe that's another uh, data, aggregate data. So we can go to the slide after that. I believe slide eight. Um, the next slide just um, highlights some local incidents where immigrants um, were attacked, people of color, women, um, um, around Santa Clara County. I'm not gonna go over each incident, but it's something for you all to check out and reference to understand the climate that our communities are facing locally. So we can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so when we look at the impact on immigrant communities, um, there's considerable underreporting under among non-citizens due to immigration status. So even though we see street vendors being attacked um, and communities being you know, harassed or attacked, we don't see them reporting because of fear of deportation. And so that's something that we really want to eliminate in our community so that they feel safe to report when incidents happen um, to themselves or family members or when they witness something happening, feeling safe and comfortable to come forward. Um, there's also concerns around elderly immigrants who are often targets of the hate crimes and in a safe environment. So I really appreciate the presentation prior to mine. And then the continued anti-Black racism coupled with um, violence by law enforcement and non-citizen status affecting um, African immigrants and refugees or just, you know, dark colored, skin colored people um, uh, in general. The next slide is recommendations. So recommendations is just continue to support robust ethnic studies, education, political education, you know, consciousness raising or what the youth like to call like being woke, right? Um, uh, ensuring that our communities understand our histories, our histories of struggle, our histories of, 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 of fighting for social justice. I think that really creates a, eliminates the barriers that we're seeing so that we understand one another. Um, support policies that reduce barriers to victims reporting hate crimes including messaging that ensures that non-citizens will not face immigration consequences for reporting, a reporting mechanism that does not necessarily involve law enforcement. We know that's also another barrier for fear of retaliation or just in general fear. Um, and then more language access, multilingual hotlines, multilingual caseworkers, case managers, people that work um, in the communities, uh, speaking to the communities locally, attending events where they feel safe um, connecting um, with county, city officials. Um, and then the, the last slide is a final recommendation. This collect and report out the segregated data on local hate crime data, incident data. This will help us for, further understand how the depth of the problem, um, ensure local government staff, especially those who interact with the public are regularly receiving cultural competency and anti-bias trainings, and ensure that local policies while ensuring COVID-19 safety do not restrict protests, including rallies, against hate crimes, we're seeing a num numerous amount of bills coming federally, um, limiting the amount of, of free speech. And that is so important when we see hate crimes happening in the community, that the community feels safe to call it out and, and organize around their communities and build that safety net for our communities. Um, and then pro provide protections tailored to street vendors who encounter violence, hate and harassment and doing some education campaign and support system for them as well. And then lastly, just expressing support for AB 655, um, 
supported by assembly member Ash Kalra, um, the CLEAR Act, um, which also holds um, police accountable that have connections uh, with hate crimes. And I will end it there. Thank you Thank so you, much. Marcella. I'm gonna now go to Myra um, from our, the executive director of Blue Knot. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Mara Pelagio, and I am the executive director of LUNA, Latinos United for New America. And we're a small nonprofit that works in the areas of East San Jose. Uh, more recently, we've been working in East Palo Alto and also in Lupitas. If you can go to the next slide. Um, so we were reached out last week um, to think through like how we can present for the for this task force. And uh, I work with a couple of our members to uh, conduct a little focus group to think through how are they experiencing these hate crimes and what do they identify as hate crimes and some of the neighborhoods represented uh, in these specific recommendations are going to be the Tropicana, Tropicana La Nai neighborhood, the Valley Palms neighborhood, Alexander, downtown San Jose, Campbell and Santee which are the zip codes 95122 and 95116 here in San Jose and others around. So if you can go to the next slide. Uh, while talking to our community members thinking through what do they identified as hate crimes and what are their, their concerns, they started seeing some of the heightened threats uh, with the 2016 election. Um, I know that a lot of the Latino community was living in fear because of uh, their immigration status, but even if they did not uh, have any problems with their immigration status, they would sometimes face individuals that would tell them, hey, go back to your country, or Trump is looking for you, or ICE is looking for you. And they just saw this increase of um, hate, language directed toward them and that was one of the concerns that they started to see again this was regardless of immigration status if a person identified as latino they would be um, prone to receive these kind of comments we also uh, talked about about how they felt more threatened once um, the retainer policy was talked about in the county i know some elected officials started to think through collaboration with ice and how can they have collaboration with ice after um, the murder of um, uh, I forget her name, Bambi, and uh, due to a, a Latino immigrant, right? And so a lot of community members started to feel that distrust with elected officials from that incident because they went on publicly and tried to um, increase the collaboration that the local authority had with ICE. Um, we also saw, we also talked about the violence against street vendors. We had a local vendor in the Tropical Lanai neighborhood who unfortunately um, passed away due to COVID. And uh, in the past, he had been assaulted three times at gunpoint. And these are elderly folks who are uh, trying to make a living through this um, uh, street vending and are facing now more than ever um, experiencing hate crimes. And um, recently, we also talked about Adam Toledo and police violence against the Latinx youth and police violence against people of color. And that was something that they found very concerning as well. Um, and we see that as well with yesterday's incident with Mario Gonzalez, um, death by uh, police violence. And that's a concern um, that the community sees as kind of like a hate crime as well. And we can go to the next slide. Some of the recommendations that we talked about was just thinking through increasing educational resources and programming for youth. Um, they recognize that a lot of the hate crimes that are happening to street vendors are happening by youth, uh, and they would like to see more programs to keep our um, community members engaged, especially the youth, in programs that will help the community. They would also like to see some information on pamphlets where they um, learn about what are hate crimes uh, and how can they identify them as well as how can they report them. Uh, they would like to see more additional trainings for police that would focus on racial justice. And they would like to see, uh, similar to what Maricela pointed out earlier, thinking through what are some of the alternatives for police response, instead of having police maybe have social workers or mental health experts in their communities as well. And I think that is all that I have for you all today. Thank you, Thank you very so much. much. Yeah, it's nice to meet you, Myra, welcome. All right, so um, I wanted to see if um, uh, if there were any uh, comments from any of the, uh, and uh, Maya, I just very quickly wanted to see if you had any comments. If not, I'm going to go to Congressmember Khanna, who's just joined us. Yeah, I'm okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Congressmember, I, I know we only have a few minutes with you, so if my colleagues are okay, we're going to toggle back. I do want to thank our three presenters and this, as you may recall, that was part of um, 
I think we had about 30 present presentations that we were all kind of rapid fire. And this was the wrap up of that section from a meeting uh, ago. So thank you again for the presenters. And uh, Congressmember Khanna, thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you for your leadership on this critical issue of uh, Asian American hate and incidents. I know uh, you have, uh, like me, participated in so many forums and rallies uh, uh, across our community in Santa Clara County and Alameda County, uh, and really heard from uh, so many uh, in their community about not just crimes, but the hurt and anguish uh, of being uh, confronted with praise, prejudice, racism, things that may not lead to a crime, but are still very hurtful and are incidents of discrimination that have no place in our society. I just wanted to say what President Biden and uh, Vice President Harris are doing and what the Congress is doing. Uh, President Biden has made it clear that there has to be standard reporting across the states and across the counties led by the Justice Department on hate crimes, uh, hate incidents. Uh, a lot of states aren't voluntarily reporting right now the way uh, California does. Uh, and that he has called for standardizing it. There's, he has reinstituted the Justice Department task force uh, to deal with uh, hate crimes uh, that are racially directed. Of course, he spoke in the State of the Union about white supremacy being one of the largest terror threats and uh, the Justice Department has prioritized this. And then in Congress, we have uh, taken up Grace Meng's resolution to have uh, clear condemnation of Asian American hate, to have it taught in our schools about the history of uh, Asian American uh, exclusion and uh, discrimination, and, and to make sure that we have the resources for reporting it, for tracking it, uh, for making sure that the government is taking action about it. But I, let me just end by saying that what you're doing here is so important. Uh, no matter what the federal government does, what the president does, what Congress does, what the Board of Supervisors may do in, in Santa Clara or city councils, Ultimately, this is not going to be solved without a lot of deep conversation, with a lot of engagement from every citizen, from parents, from faith leaders, from teachers, from educators, uh, from law enforcement, from all the pillars of our community to come together to call out hate when we see it, uh, whether it's in a coffee shop, whether it's in our classroom, uh, to be mindful of being inclusive, to look out for people who may not feel comfortable speaking up uh, to uh, listen and have empathy for each other's culture and tradition. It's what I love most about Fremont, about the Bay Area, about art. I, I think it's what's so unique about where we live and we need to really cherish it, celebrate our diversity uh, and uh, listen to each other uh, in this time where some of our community members are really hurting. So Supervisor Travis, I know this has been your uh, life motto, the way you've lived your life and values, and I appreciate your leadership on this. Thank you. I, I wonder if, if there are any, um, any bills uh, in particular you want us to be thinking about, and then I'll see if there are any questions from my colleagues. Just go ahead and raise your virtual hands and we'll uh, see if uh, we can ask Congressmember Khanna to respond to them. But I wondered if there was any bill that you particularly wanted us to keep our eyes on and provide support to. There, there is, and the, the bill uh, that is most relevant is Grace Meng's bill uh, in uh, the House, which we passed, which just says, let's have every elected official condemn Asian hate and let's have recording of Asian American uh, hate. Unfortunately, that hasn't passed the Senate, and we need to make sure that uh, it, it, it passes the Senate. Uh, we have had some narrower hate crimes legislation pass the Senate, which was encouraging. But I think uh, Grace Meng, who's really been a leader on this issue, has the most comprehensive bill to support. Great, thank you. Um, Alan? Yes, I just wanted to um, kind of make a comment, uh, not so much a question for the Congressman. Thank you for your time here today. I'm a deputy chief with the San Jose Police Department. I oversee investigations. And I just wanted to comment uh, from a law enforcement professional standpoint, I do believe it is extremely critical that we are introducing education in the schools and really trying to um, you know, intercept some of the tendencies that are, might be learned at, at a very young level. And, and we do see some of those um, effects when we you know, try to 
um, kind of stop the cycle as it relates to gang violence and things of that nature. So just wanted to kind of give a shout out to the importance of uh, the youth intervention that some of our speakers spoke to today and that I think as a committee, we really want to look at prioritizing um, that type of um, education and training for the youth so we can kind of interrupt that cycle. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, this is real. That's really important. Are there any other comments or questions for our Congress member? Uh, this is Raimundo from uh, South County. So um, I just wanted to build a little bit on what uh, the comments that were just mentioned. And I think this is an issue that's been brought up here in Gilroy um, during the garlic festival shooting of you're all familiar that happened in 2019. Um, one of the issues we wanted to um, build on, or one of the points that, that the officer made was around gang members and in their involvement in hate crimes. Um, I think we wanted to uh, consider the idea of um, hate groups like skinheads or white supremacist groups being, um, you know, treated or um, look, you know, considered as gang members because um, it's basically very similar. It's just um, their their focus is different, of course. It's a uh, it's a gang focusing on 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 white supremacy, racism, hatred. Thank you. Um, are, and I'll see if there are any questions for Congressmember Khanna. I know we only have you for a few minutes, so I'll just I'll go to Jay. And uh, if not, I, I'll just make some comments about you joining us and see if Maya has any as well. Thank you, Congressmember Khanna, for being here and for your comments. I just wanted to note that Congress did recently pass a bill that was promoted by Senator Maisie Hirano of Hawaii. And what I wanted to state for this task force is that it passed overwhelmingly 94 to one in the Senate, but there was one vote against the bill. And I want people here to know the name of the person. It was Senator Josh Hawley of Missouri who voted against that bill. Thank you, Jay. And Ro, your staff just told me you have to leave. So uh, well, <laughs> I think they have something on a call with a Roger Krishnamurthy on India because of the situation that's yeah. going on there. So I, uh, uh, but I appreciate all of your leadership and uh, appreciate uh, so much uh, what you're doing uh, and look forward to continuing to, to engage on this. Thank you. And I, I uh, Congressmember Khanna, thank you for playing a leadership role nationally. And both Maya and I, and uh, who've been co-chairing this committee, um, Councilmember Esparza and I are really grateful to you for taking the time to join us. And we'll we'll loop you back in as we go further down the the um, the path of what we learn and the kinds of actions we're going to take at a local level. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank work. you very much. Really appreciate thank you. you. Bye bye. All right, so um, we had these great presentations. I wanted to see if there were any questions or comments for um, Lily or um, Maricela or Myra. And um, Lily has to go back to school in a bit. So I wanted to make sure we gave her that we, we got our questions in if there were any comments or questions. Virginia? Uh, yes, how are you today? Um, um, Supervisor Chavez and all the others. I just wanted to give a comment on all the speakers today and just, you know, um, thank you for coming forward and, um, you know, just letting us know recommendations that you have. Lily, I know you have to go back to school, but um, your idea of toolkits, making sure that there's a support network for victims, the offender families, um, I just kind of want to add that for restor restorative justice, we might have to look at victim families too when it comes to, you know, the different hate crimes. Um, Maricela, thank you so much for being inclusive of all races, the ethnicities, genders, and even citizenship, citizenship status. And then Myra, just talking about the education and the ethnic studies that are needed in our schools. One thing as a mental health provider, we do look to educate and bring knowledge to the community. And I think that, you know, from the focus groups that some of you have set up, maybe we can look at talking circles or healing circles where we can move forward and um, dealing with the hate crimes um, and being all inclusive of all race, genders, and, and citizens, so, or, or those that are in, in immig immigrants. So, um, you know, I would just like to maybe propose that once focus groups are concentrated on, that we start looking at 
maybe talking circles that can be set up in churches, high schools, and nonprofit agencies. Now we can continue to educate and bring knowledge to all of us. Thank you. Thanks, Virginia. Baha? I, I just wanted to amplify exactly what Virginia just talked about and amplify everything that the speakers have said, particularly Lily and, uh, and actually all of them in talking about prevention through education and engagement. And we have evidence from the work that we do, which is in education and engagement uh, that proves without a doubt that the more that young people, um, the more that adults even, I do a lot of work also with corporations and law enforcement agencies, um, and um, rotary clubs and so forth, that the more the adults know, not just about the problem of hate, but something about the community that is the target of hate. And the more that there is engagement with that community, the lower the hate crimes are, the hate incidences, the microaggressions uh, that people um, experience. So I can't stress enough how important it is to put into action um, and policy the recommendations that were uh, provided by, by all of the speakers and uh, particularly uh, Lily's um, uh, concerns in, uh, in schools. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for Maricela and Mayra from Luna right. and Siren. Raimundo, Raimundo, I'm gonna come back to you and I, I, I see you can't use the hand raise function, but I called on Susan and then I'll come to you. Thank okay. you. Hello, uh, can you hear me? I can, thanks. Okay, uh, I just wanted to, um, uh, reinforce the idea of education, but I wanted to make a comment about the content of education that I think is really important. Um, I think that it's really important for students to start to learn about white supremacy very explicitly and also about how the model minority strategy is used to uphold white supremacy and how that affects white students and how that affects black and Latino students as well as Asian American students. Um, the, the model minority strategy is very explicitly meant to have people of color compete for a second tier status in a racial hierarchy. And I think it's really important um, for, in addition to learning the history of racism against um, people of color to also understand the political strategies that are used to divide us. And um, th this is happening uh you know on steroids today so i think it's really important for people to understand that strategy and students can definitely learn that and understand it thank you thanks susan uh raymundo yeah i'm sorry I, I was on my phone so i haven't figured out how to use the raise no your problem. hand <laughs> yeah but i will figure that out anyways uh my questions are from maricela from siren and from uh, mayra from luna um, are you are either of your agencies collecting data on street vendors and hate crimes experienced by street vendors? And um, secondly, is do you, if not, do you know of an agency here in our county that is collecting, um, you know, that information or documenting, um, you know, these these crimes? Hey, Raimundo, um, no, I don't know of anyone that's collecting data on that. I know we also have an office in Fresno where a Latino street vendor was murdered, right? Um, and the city council developed a um, committee to start working and assessing and, and, and um, collecting data, which I think, think was a really smart idea. Um, but I don't know of anything in Santa Clara County right now. Yeah, Luna is also not collecting data and we don't know anybody. I think um, maybe the organization Brown Issues might um, know who is collecting data, but they're more of statewide. Okay, thank you guys. Um, yeah, I just, I asked because it, it is happening down here in South County as well. Thank yeah, you. That's really good feedback. Um, any other comments on the, on four or five? Uh, if not, I'm gonna go to public comment and um, and then we're gonna, we're gonna move on through our agenda. At the end of the agenda, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our work groups and next steps, uh, but thank you for that, that all that information, it was, it was, very good addition to what we heard earlier. Um, so if I could ask the staff to call our public comment. Our first speaker is Irvish. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. 
Uh, again, you know, I wanted to thank you for uh, all the board of supervisor and as well as uh, uh, all the commissioner and the members with regards to the task force. Uh, I wanted to specifically mention about uh, with the recent uh, development about the uh, task force on the hate crimes. Uh, the, from Santa Clara, uh, from Santa Clara County's uh, perspective, there has been a re there has been a recent spike in the hate crimes, and from a prevention program perspective, there has been a uh, there has been a, a report of a physical attacks, verbal ones uh, towards the community members, as well as uh, uh, as well as the all walks of uh, different uh, experiences they have been uh, they've been experiencing with the with the hate crime. With specific to the Asian American, Latinos, and uh, Latinos, Vietnamese, and uh, uh, and the, uh, and the Afro American community, it is very important to address one thing: is that no matter what the community belongs to, the the community is required to have an experience of the harmony uh, or of the harmonious environment where they will, where they would be able to where they would be able to evaluate the situation that you know they are the they are equally uh, rather than a migrant or a migrant, but being a part of a country and be able to walk uh, freely or freely on the on the street. Also, it is important to uh, make sure that the commu uh, that the communism is being maintained and as well as uh, being taught and educated to the community members through the task force that you know how to uh, uh, how to approach towards the. Uh, the issues of a hate crimes and anti-racism within the community with the outreach and education program. There has been a federal bill, uh, Senate Federal Bill 937, that has been introduced in the 117th Congress to address the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act. I request, I, I'm going to request the Congressman Rokhanna's office to support that bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're now going to um, move to item seven. And this is to discuss text of proposed resolution for law enforcement training and for better policies. And this item, I am going to turn to one of our task force members. Um, and I think that is Richard Conda to introduce this item for discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Chavez. Um, the, um, the, the draft resolution was part of the packet and I'll just highlight a couple of points on it. Um, one is that, um, as far back as 2018, the state auditor had found that law enforcement had not adequately identified, reported, or responded to hate crimes and recommended various steps in terms of better training of law enforcement officers, clearer law enforcement agency protocols for identifying, reporting, and responding to hate crimes. And uh, we think it's really important because at this point, there's an assembly bill introduced by assembly member uh, Jesse Gabriel which would mandate post hate crimes training for all officers, would mandate California Department of Justice supports for law enforcement agencies, and would require Department of Justice alongside civil rights law enforcement and academic experts to review all law enforcement agency hate crimes policies. So um, what the, this does is kind of ask for a resolution by the Board of Supervisors to recommend that each law enforcement agency in Santa Clara County, that's including county, state, and state, and campus police agencies take uh, these immediate steps. One, require all officers who take the post-learning portal course, hate crimes identification and investigation as updated in August, 2020, beginning with officers um, who have not taken any version of the course, and then going back to officers who have taken prior versions. Two, reach out to affected communities in their jurisdictions to consult fully on changes in addition to their hate crimes policies, including the requirements of Penal Code Section 422.87 and 13.519.6c, and then adapt these changes and additions um, that communities and law enforcement agencies agree upon as required by law. Three, publicly announce the above two steps, and four, work with the California Police Chiefs Association and California State Sheriff's Association to encourage them to support AB 57 and any other bills uh, mandating steps recommended by the state auditor, or at a minimum, remain neutral on those bills. So that's the, the extent of the um, um, draft that we wanna consider. 
Great. And um, what I'll do is I'll ask if folks could raise their hands if they'd like to weigh in on this issue. And uh, Greg, I'll start with you. I'm, I'm glad to see the uh, task force taking on these immediate steps so early in its in its work. Um, these are this is certainly not anywhere near all that needs to be done, but these are immediate steps that can be taken now and that uh, in some cases will will the opportunity will be lost if they're not taken now. So uh, I hope that others will who have uh, other thoughts on things that can be done immediately will bring them forward in future meetings. Uh -huh. Can just add my voice in support of um, of what Richard um, just proposed and what Greg said. And um, Greg, Nancy, and I are post advisors on hate crimes, and uh, we were present when they shared with us um, uh, the results of surveys of um, of of whether law enforcement uh, knows what a hate crime is, how to identify a hate crime, and something uh, like eighty. 80 some percent police departments um, hadn't uh, done uh, training and, uh, and the vast majority don't know how, how to identify a hate crime. And, and the reason I know this is that I do police training almost daily across the state of California, including right here in, uh, in, in our area. And the vast majority of the, law, of the police officers, I have a section on hate crimes. It's an eight hour training. I have a section on hate crimes as it relates to Muslim Americans and anyone who's perceived to be Muslim American. And uh, it's just astounding to me to see that the vast majority don't know, they can't even define a hate crime, let alone uh, look for indicators uh, you know, for hate crimes, which is directly related to the training that we do on culture diversity. So it's an incredibly important thing to happen uh, up and down the state of California and actually all across the country. We need a federal law that requires this. So where, and I think hate crimes, um, there's a hate crime law in every state in, in, in the country, but as far as California, there's a strong one here. So I absolutely support what Richard and Greg um, just um, just said. Thank you. Uh, Nancy? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I can't figure out how to virtually raise my hand. So no thank you for, for spotting me. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm with the Anti-Defamation League and uh, based in our when I'm at work in our San Francisco office covering um, all of Northern California. And I just want to uh, um, also endorse uh, the the resolution, um, state our support for it, uh, concur with the uh, previous comments. And um, I, I hope the task force can support it as well. Thank you, Tamil. Uh, Tamil, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I really wanted to just echo support. Evergreen Valley College obviously has an administration of justice program and does uh, training and support. So I think it's really great to support this resolution. I do want to call out one thing, though, is just a question about the beginning. Um, um, the intro statement is I absolutely and you know, um, support the language around the increase in anti-Asian hate. I just want to remind folks that this has been happening for decades. It's not a new thing. And I feel like the elimination of all the voices we've heard over the last two sessions, not calling out um, what our Latinx community, Muslim community, what other communities have said, I, it feels funny to me. So I just thought um, because we're kind of representing hate crimes that are existing across um, the, the communities that are served, I just, I don't know if there's a way to make a modification that really kind of uplifts that we've been hearing that that spoken in the last two meetings. Yeah, if uh, any of the authors can give feedback to that, I think that's actually a really good point because we're really talking about hate crimes writ large. Greg, did you want to respond to that? Um, sure, I think that would be a good idea. I don't know if we can, if we can sit here and rewrite it right now. But uh, if there's a, if there's a procedure where um, some language referring to all the other communities uh, can be added before it goes to the board of supervisors, I think that would be. Well, the other possibility is we just say the dreadful surge of hate crimes, not just anti-Asian, but just say hate crimes. That would be agreeable to me. Great, thank you. Yeah, and, and second, uh, you know, I, it, this should be a, a, a consensus document, so. Kavita? 
Thank you. I was going to make the same suggestion you did, Supervisor Chavez, and just indicate that the, as we can see from the watermark on this document, the goal of today is to have a, you know, as, as comprehensive a discussion as, as needed and then take a vote on the item and certainly changes can be made that the group agrees upon when this goes to the Board of Supervisors for final adoption. And I will make sure to track what those changes are. I want to see if there's any um, public safety folks who want to weigh in on this after Richard does again. Go ahead, Richard. I didn't mean, you know. Yeah. I just want to say, I think it's, I, I, we want the Board of Supervisors obviously to adopt this, but I think it's important for this, this task force to also endorse it because we want to forward the endorsement of this task force, if we can, to the state legislature. Is that is that something we can do as a task force? Savita? So not as a task force, the action mm -hmm. item that's on the agenda today is to discuss and approve the text and forward the resolution to the Board of Supervisors for consideration. When the board takes action, I think their um, action item could include what you um, recommended, Richard. Unfortunately, the task force as an advisory body doesn't have the power to do that um, unless authorized by the board. Understood, thank you. One thing um, I will add um, to this that I do know that my colleagues in general don't, there's a hesitancy and, and I would just say this for item four, which is work with the California Police Officers Association and California State um, Sheriff's Association to encourage them to support AB 57. Um, when it says in any other bills recommended by the state auditor or to minimum remain neutral, since they won't know what those bills are, there will be some of my colleagues who say, we don't know what those are. Um, so I just wanna let you know that as it comes to the board, that will probably be a discussion uh, or it, there, there will be some, some modification to that part of it. Um, uh, Richard, did you have another comment? Uh, Greg, did you have another comment? I just wanted to, in response to Richard's comment that uh, while the the task force, of course, is is bound by the its di directions from the board of supervisors, this is a public action, and there's nothing to prevent anybody from letting any legislator know about what the task force is considering, which, in fact, I've already done. Right. Any other comments from anybody on the committee? And I, I'm asking again for law enforcement because we have law enforcement members here. I just want to see if there's any thoughts or anybody wants to weigh in. I don't see any. Um, so with that, what what I would do is, um, you know, in general, I, I I'm very interested in us moving forward on these items in a in a consensus fashion. We have a like I said, a subset that votes because that that voting member is just to make sure we have we have. Um, forum at every meeting, um, but I would be interested in just getting everybody's uh, thoughts on this. So what I'm going to ask the clerk to do is a roll call vote of the advisory board members and then a roll call vote of all of our advice. Uh, I'm sorry, a roll call vote of the committee and the roll call vote of all of our advisory members. So we make sure we know uh, that we were inclusive and we know what people are what people are thinking. So if I could ask the clerk to begin the the, oh, I'm sorry, we have one public speaker on this item and then we'll come back for a vote. Okay, two minutes for this speaker. Yes, please. Our first speaker is Irvish. I am unmuting you, please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Irvish, are you there? Yeah, thank you, um, hello. Thank you very Go much. Uh, uh, I wanted to mention to uh, all the council members about the Happy Communities, uh, uh, Happy Communities update with regards to the recent uh, hate crimes within the uh, within the Santa Clara County, and as well as the AP, uh, the American Asian American and Pacific Islander community. Uh, they have mentioned about the about 3,800 hate crimes that has happened in in the communities from March 2020 to February 2021. Also to mention here that after having the, the community's uh, uh, conversation with the California State Assembly member Ed Chow, 
there was a new bill, AB 28, which was introduced uh, in order to increase the fines uh, for the misdemeanor and felony hate crimes uh, with the $2,500, which raises to the $7,500 and $12,500 respectively. Any, uh, also the bill requires any uh, fine for a hate crime to be put into a fund with the racial and ethnic sensitivity programs and training as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we'll go back to the clerk for action on this item. I'm, I'm sorry, you wanted to capture a vote of the voting members? Yes, and then the advisory members. May, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to capture a motion or a second. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it would be that. Thank you. <laughs> I'll make the motion to adopt the resolution with the change in the first whereas so that it just says surge of hate crimes instead of anti-Asian. I'd like to second that motion. And that was from Dr. Dewan. So we have a motion and a second. So we're going to begin with the um, task force members and then we'll go to advisory members. Thank you. Chairperson Travis. Yes. Co I Apologies, Co-Chairperson Esparza? Yes. Member Lee? Yes. Member Boyarski? Yes. Member Smith? Pardon, uh, Member Lori Smith? <laughs> apologies. Um, support, but obviously I would have to see legislation prior. So it's not just a blanket, I'll support all legislation. But uh, in concept, yes. Thank you, Member O'Neill is absent yes uh i'm sorry mr epps unfortunately i can't register your vote for member o'neill um member smith dr smith yes thank you member narayan yes member no yes and with the same comments as uh, sheriff smith member washburn yes Member Dewan? Yes. Member Armeline? Member Armeline, we lost you. I I'm here, you. yes. Sorry, Thank my you. audio was not working there for some reason. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Thanks for the vote. Member Appel? Yes. Member Yeager? Yes. Member Estramera? Yes. Member El Giannotti? Yes. Member Conda? Yes. Thank you. That passes. Thank you. And then I'm going to go through the advisory board members as well. Do you have that list? I do have that list. It's expansive, and I'm not sure who's in the room or not. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to go through the entire list. That would be great. Thank you. Advisory member Wong? Uh, yes. Advisory member, yes. thank you. Advisory member Gilkerson? Yes. Member Shell? Absent. Member Rose? Absent. Member O'Brien? Absent. Member Arangio? Really, were you in the room earlier? Member Aaron? Yes. Member Williams? Yes. Member Sakamoto? Yes. Member Kazantis? Kira, apologies. Yes. Thank yes. you. Member Gonzalez? Ron Gonzalez, member Tetnowski, member Ballantin. Yes. Member Ballantin, thank you. Member Tram. Yes. Member DePello Garcia. Yes. Member Fernando. Member. Lartig? Yes. Thank you. Member Silvertop? Member Barafis? 
Caldera Barafas. Member Armendariz. Yes. Thank you, member. Pardon me, Susan. Hey, Yase. Yes. Thank you so much. Member Morales. Dolores Morales. Uh, yes. Thank you. Member Coley. Member Constantine. Yes. Coley, yes. Thank you, Member Coley. Member Constantine. Member Abe Koga. Hi. Thank you. Member Kalra. Ash Kalra. Um, Zoe Lofgren. I'm sorry, I'm going to say whole names now. For Congresswoman Lofgren, this is Carrie Duncan. Um, yes, with any future legislation to be reviewed, of course. Thank you all. You're both advisory members, so I'll register your vote. Uh, Sandra Soto. Simeon Chen. Ahmad Thomas. This is Peter Larome Munoz on behalf of Ahmad Thomas. Yes, with the opportunity to review the language. Thank you. Leland Campbell. Uh, yes. Thank you. Michelle Mashburn. Michelle. Uh, Samina Usman. Yes. Mauricio Palma. Yes. Alicia Parti. Yes. Virgin Thank you, Alicia. Virginia Jones. Yes. Mariko Sayak. So sorry. Greg DeJere. Yes. Nerver Singh. Yes. Kath, oh, thank you very much. That concludes the vote. Yes, thank you. That is not easy. Thank you all. And thank um, you. and I will make sure that we're we're clear um, that that the comment about the um, future legislation is also clear in the in the memorandum as it goes to the board. All right. So now we're going to go on to item back to item six, and this is a report from the uh, our Department of Social Justice for Anti-Racism Community Outreach and Education Campaign in response to Supervisor Otto Lee's referral. And I think, um, Supervisor Lee, I'm going to turn it over to you and then to Betty. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Very well. Thank you. Um, yes, this was a referral that we put out. Uh, uh, basically, there was two two referrals that started with. We started back in May. Uh, excuse me, in, back in March. Uh, initially, a uh, referral to um, declare the uh, having a resolution for a whole board to recognize to condemn hate crimes, and that certainly passed unanimously. Uh, and then the very next morning is what happened at the Deardon Station when the Filipina uh, worker going to work at PAMF uh, got assaulted. Uh, sexually and, and all these uh, anti-racist work being said. So that's why we have to come up with second uh, referral to try to bring about not just words, but actually action to come through. And uh, one of the things that we, we really want to focus on is exactly what are the things that we could do in terms of training uh, and what type of resources we can come through. The county is working on the uh, a, a, a lot of the ideas, uh, trying to make sure that we get those issues addressed in a, a very uh, fundamental way with resources, uh, with actions, uh, so that we are, we're talking about things like bystander trainings, we're talking about things like uh, uh, putting resources uh, to potentially uh, how to make sure that our community can feel safe and go outside again. So I want to also uh, turn over to uh, Betty as well to uh, go into more details on some of the recommendation uh, that we're considering. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Hopefully, I can get this right. Uh, Betty, if you do that, let me just um, say one thing that um, just for the group, I know you receive this information very late. 
Um, and in part, there was a some miscommunication that we had asked at the board that this come to you all first, just to get your feedback before it goes to the Board of Supervisors. So this was a little bit of a timing issue, but we wanted to stay on track, which is why we're bringing it to you a bit late. So with that, I'll, Betty, you're, we can see your screen. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and my apologies. Um, I am the staff that was responsible for completing this presentation, and it was a little later than um, should have been provided to you all. Um, so good afternoon, members of the Hate Crimes Task Force. I am Betty Young with the Office of the County Executive. On behalf of the offices of the Division of Equity and Social Justice, I will be presenting the county's outreach and education campaign um, proposal in response to anti-Asian sentiment, hate, and violence. I also want to just um, acknowledge um, our Deputy County Executive, Rocio Luna, who is with us today. I don't know, Rocio, if you'd like to say a couple words. I think, uh, I think that we're looking forward to any feedback that you have, and I'm really excited about uh, Betty's presentation. So I'll just hand it right back over. Thanks, Betty. Thank you. Before I start, I just want to acknowledge that today is April 30th, and it's a very germane to our conversation today in this presentation. It is the anniversary of the fall of Saigon. Many of our Vietnamese uh, members of our Vietnamese community are mourning today and reflecting during this very um, significant time. Um, it is that uh, the 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 significance is not lost on me that I, as a daughter of Vietnamese refugees, will be presenting this um, response, this proposal to combat anti-Asian hate. So staff will be, I'll be providing a brief presentation, um, very brief portion of my presentation will be a quick recap of the current climate and the drivers of this longstanding issue and harm against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders to provide context for our county response. These are very heavy topics and I wanted to start with sharing these very uplifting images from an anti-Asian hate rally this past Sunday. Over a thousand people were in attendance. The premier speakers were our community's youth from left to right in that middle um, role right there is James, a sophomore from Archbishop Mitty, Mariah, a poet and nursing student, and Ashlyn, who at 13 years old is a fashion designer and community activist who has led multiple uh, marches herself this past year. So some good energy, positive framing. <laughs> the current climate, stopaapihate.org is a self-reporting platform for hate incidents, violence, and harassment against AAPI individuals. Dr. Russell Jung in the corner there of my screen um, is a professor of Asian American studies at, at San Francisco State and one of the creators of stopaapihate.org. Since March 10th, 2020, the site has received 3,795 reports. The majority of reports involve verbal harassment and name calling, physical assault, accounts for uh, which includes reports of pushing shoving and slapping account for the third most reported category of hate acts the emphasis on physical violence would not be an accurate reflection of the current climate because non-physical violence in the form of verbal harassment has been and continues to be normalized and continues to create and reinforce trauma amongst its victims a couple of things to note per dr jung is that the majority of youth reports fall on the category of online harassment and that the category of being coughed on and spat upon is a recently added um, section. There were so many reports of being coughed on or spat on um, that a new category had this, this new category had to be added recently. This data set goes from March 10th, 2020 through February 9th, 2021. As of last week, the number of self-reported, self-submitted reports have doubled. The next set of slides reflects Santa Clara County specific data extracted from stopaapihate.org. A huge thanks to Dr. Zhang and the stopaapihate.org team for creating these slides for us today. So here's the gender distribution specific to Santa Clara County, which reflects the national reporting numbers that, um, that women and gender expansive individuals who identify as women are twice as likely to be assaulted or attacked or harassed. Here is a distribution by age group. Distribution by location with the majority of incidents taking place at a place of business, whether the victim was a patron of a business or an employer or worker on site. Suspected reasons for discrimination and um, percent distribution.
ethnicity distribution. Incidence. The type of uh, the categories of incidents that's taking that's taking place here in Santa Clara County specifically. Can remember that being coughed on or spat on is a new category that was recently added, and the organizers of the site expect to see growing numbers there. So, again, even in Santa Clara County, verbal harassment covers the largest share of reports. These incidents are acts of cowardice, targeting those who are seemingly vulnerable, or elders, women, and gender expansive individuals. 132 incidents is what is registered for Santa Clara County. County. It is 132 incidents too many, and we have no doubt that this number reflects severe underreporting, um, where we will be seeing what the numbers look like for Santa Clara County um, once um, our team, our friends at the StopAAPIHate.org will be able, is able to process the recent data post-February. Um, So this hate is not new, as many of the members of the task force has previously mentioned, has existed for centuries. The racialization of Asian Americans create opposing stereotypes that are easily interchangeable to fit and fulfill racist, divisive, and xenophobic narratives. Historically, and even now, Asian Americans have been regarded as perpetual foreigners, as threats to national security and health, as those who would take jobs and bring disease. This illustration from the archives of the San Francisco Chronicle depicts the specters of malaria, smallpox, and leprosy emanating from, from San Francisco's Chinatown. On the other end of this insider outsider spectrum is the model minority myth, which promotes a false premise that Asians as a minority group are successful and therefore systemic and structural racism does not exist. The myth frames the AAPI community as white adjacent and the opposition to progressive policies. Perpetual foreigner stereotype, um, the, the stereotype is incre incredibly insidious and resurges in times of war, such as the Japanese American internment during World War II and the scapegoating of South Asians during 9-11. It comes up during economic recession, um, such as the murder of Vincent Chen because his assailants thought he was Japanese during a time when the US car manufacturing industry was suffering and in times of pandemic. In 1900, San Francisco experienced the bubonic plague. Health officials roped off Chinatowns and neighborhoods. White people were free to come and go, but Asians and other people of color living behind these ropes were not allowed to leave, leaving them to suffer the plague. The article to the right, top right of my screen right there, is a headline from last year observing that the treatment of Asian Americans during the bubonic plague are playing out again today. Last year, all the historical conditions that I previously mentioned were present and drove new policy against our communities. The Muslim, the, the previous federal administration uh, revised the Muslim ban to include Asian countries, suspended migration of Chinese researchers and scientists, and cut migration visas for refugee resettlement and H-1B visas. All these policies make up a second Chinese Exclusion Act deeming Asians as outsiders, national security threats, and diseased health threats. As we're dismantling this insider-outsider framework, our county stands in solidarity with movements and efforts attempting to disrupt the black-white divide. So how will the county respond? By doing all the things right away. That's a line from Supervisor Chavez, and um, it's going to be our, our rallying cry. On Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, staff will propose a communications and education framework that that includes um, categories of um, for work to be fought. I'm sorry. Um, we'll include a uh, communications and education framework, which includes prevention, data and reporting, response, healing and recovering. Um, these are examples of the type of events and actions that we will be pursuing. Um, it's not a full inventory of events because a lot of we're going to be guided by our community leaders. We we are we look forward to working in partnership with community and having and supporting community-led solutions. But in the category of prevention, community listening sessions and healing spaces, education and learning opportunities, practical skills training, such as bystander trainings and know your rights trainings, so that um, an individual when subjected to discrimination in the workplace and public settings um, are aware of their rights and, and have the resources and tools to be able to advocate. Um, the second category of data and reporting, because data is so lacking in this area, 
that there are steps that we can take as a county organization to advance um, more complete collection and disaggregation of Asian American Pacific Islander data as it relates to hate crimes and as it relates to county services. Um, so disaggregation of API, identifying disaggregation, opportunities for disaggregation of data across county departments, um, you know, current existing efforts to collect data and also where opportunities exist to collect additional data that would be helpful in, in our charge and promoting reporting platforms such as stopaapihate.org. There are other uh, reporting platforms as well that we will be sharing um, in our report on Tuesday. And I will also include it in my notes that I'll send to the clerk of the board to be shared with members of the task force today. And the category of response, these are time lim limited um, immediate responses that community members and leaders can deploy and use when another um, significant incident of hate occurs. This includes a campaign and communications plan um, that I'll be going over in detail um, subsequently, and also a communications toolkit, which is previously mentioned by another present, present, presenter. Um, I myself um, and my family has experienced um, acts of um, violence. My mother was assaulted in February of this year in downtown San Jose. Um, we, there were, you know, respecting my mother's wishes, we released very few details and specifics about the story. But through lived experience and being able to leverage what privileges I have, being part of the PIO operation here at Santa Clara County, um, our family, my sisters and I were able to put together talking points to make sure that we that the media framed the narrative appropriately, um, and and to 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 leverage this as an opportunity for greater awareness. So you know, myself, staff, and the team will leverage what, what the PIO communications team over at the EOC will be able to identify. And, and the resources um, to put together a proposed communications toolkit that can be easily leveraged whenever future incidents occur um, to take back the narrative and reclaim agency for our victims and their families and survivors. The fourth category is recovery and healing. These are long-term solutions, um, such as development of a county hate crimes rapid response plan. How do we have resources in place to be quickly deployed to meet the community where they are when a traumatic collective impact um, um, event occurs. Um, continue to, exp to expand and understand and, and develop law enforcement's role um, in community when these events occur or when, the, when there's heightened sense of fear and concern about what may occur. Uh, community review of existing county resources and need for additional resources. This encompasses um, categories of work, which includes language accessibility, making sure that services, victim services and services, preventative services, behavioral health services, um, the services the community may need in this situation are culturally competent and language, fully language accessible with no barriers to access. To access. Um, so this is the framework with some for sure things that we're, we're moving forward with. Now, there are a lot of opportunities for additional events and engagements. Oh, and we're going to be using now I hate that the pyramid of hate exists, but it does and we will use it as a tool. Um, here it has this escalation mo escalating model of bias, prejudice, discrimination, violence and deadly acts. Using this model, our team has crafted an additional framework to help identify events and help um, craft events and opportunities with community with our leaders to be able to address um, the, these layers of, of, of bias and hate, but you know we're not we're not doing it in consecutive order. This is this is this is all work that can be all done simultaneously at the same time of each other. So just a really quick review, um, you know, bias attitudes. That's the stereotyping, fears of differences, justifying biases by seeking out like-minded people. Um, you know, the 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 plan of action to inoculate against bias attitudes is education, um, reclaiming the humanity of our communities of color. Um, telling the stories of those who have been systematically omitted from, from academia, education, and formalized learning. Acts of bias. This could cover non-inclusive language, insensitive remarks, microaggressions, bias and belittle jokes, and cultural appreciate, appropriation. Here, we look for opportunities for community connection, events that promote dialogue, cultural celebrations um, that promote greater learning, conducting community engagement listening sessions with communities so that their voices are heard and, it's, and their agency is part of the solution. Discrimination, criminal justice disparities, inequitable school resource distribution, housing segregation, and equitable employment opportunities, wage disparities. Um, this is where we seek a plan of restorative justice, which can include bystander training, engagement with communities at risk of hate 
incidents and crimes to raise awareness of laws, rights, and increasing reporting and resources and services to serve them, um, policy advocacy and community investment. Bias motivated violence. Um, this is where we seek solution, community led solutions that promote community care, um, survivor resources. Um, this this would be, you know, this would be immediate responses, community patrol, community ambassador programs, which have been largely successful in San Francisco and Oakland. Deadly acts, the pinnacle of this pyramid. And this is where a plan of accountability needs to be thoughtfully and carefully crafted, which includes enforcement, taking lessons learned, not missing that opportunity, healing in a rapid response network. We, and like I mentioned before, we look to our community partners, our community stakeholders to be able to tell us, um, work with us in terms of what we need. We want this to be a community led approach with a framework that's able to leverage the county's resources and activate our staff to be able to respond quickly. Just wanna also give a little inventory of the engagement education has happened. In mid-March, um, following the, the, the mass shooting in Atlanta, uh, which targeted Asian American women, um, since then, every week, our, our team has been a part of or hosting some type of um, engagement education learning opportunity. So I just, um, I won't list them all here, but I just want to point out on March 27, there was something that was very personally healing for myself. And many of you on the, the hate crimes task force was, was, was there. It was a community healing vigil that was co-hosted by, um, by a diversity of community-based organizations at Grand Century, um, which is you know, um, part of Little Saigon. I grew up here. I would never have expected to see a community healing vigil there. So it was very, it was very home-like and it was very comforting. Now, what happened there was that our community-based organizations have reached out and said, hey, we need this space. We don't have the capacity. We're not able to go, we don't have the energy right now to go and collect the resources to make this vigil happen. And that, and that was a role that they needed for the county to fulfill um, without any type of branding or, you know, we were very behind the scenes. And that was something that we were able as county staff to contribute to, to, to the community's healing. Um, I guess I talked about it now when we didn't talk about it then. Um, okay. So what can we do? Um, so in addition to further development of this plan, I just wanna point out like very quick things. Um, this is my public service announcement. There are bystander intervention trainings currently available um, that are free. Here's a two, two um, available resources, ihalabac.org and CARE trainings, provide trainings. This is a, these two cards on the side here are examples of the different trainings they have. And then a promotion, the, and then again, stop aapihate.org as a reporting platform, uh, which I certainly appreciate is very local, locally based, but covers national, um, but what's, it tracks national reporting and uh, anyone, not just Asian Americans are able to use the site to report incidents. And I'm going to end with this slide. Just going to give a shout out to my daughter who has joined me at every single rally that we've been to. And, you know, just a bit of a grounding image here that this work is so personal to us all and it means so much to us. Thank you so much for your time and for your commitment to the Hate Crimes Task Force. I will now be available for any discussions. Don't know if I have all the answers, but I will certainly take all questions and feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much, Betty. I'm going to go first to my co-chair. Uh, Councilmember Esparza. Thank you. Um, thank you, Betty, and uh, thank you for um, likewise taking an experience that impacted your family and, and taking action on that. I definitely relate to that. Um, I actually had wanted to share this with the task force, but the, since this is going before the Board of Supervisors, um, and, and thank you to everybody making that happen. Um, one of the things I had wanted to bring up was the hatecrimebook.com. It's an effort. It's uh, part of a national effort that started actually in the private sector first, and then government has joined on. And there are three books. There's one that's an LA, Orange County based book on how to report a hate crime. And then there's a San Francisco, Oakland book, how to report a hate crime locally there. And there's one for New York. Um, the, a lot of this work has already been translated into Korean, Japanese, simplified Chinese, Spanish, Thai, and Vietnamese. Um, 
I'm sure there's a lot more that, that we can, a lot more languages that we can add to that, but um, a lot of that has already been done. And so I just wanted to share that because other um, municipalities across the country are looking to the hatecrimebook.com as sort of an opportunity and they print actual books and hand them out, particularly in the elders um, of our community that, um, that have, have experienced these uh, crimes and incidents. That's it for me, thank you. Thanks, Maya. Uh, Maha? Um, I was really touched by the, by the presentation, Betty. Thank you so much. And I noticed that you cannot give me your email because we don't have a chat feature here, but it, it would be great if I could get your, um, your email. And the reason I'm asking for it is that my organization was very much influenced by BLM, uh, Black Lives Matter movement, which is sort of our modern day civil rights movement. And it really made me understand that I cannot continue working on Islamophobia without looking at anti-Blackness in this country because they're directly related and rooted um, in the same uh, area. And so we started a new program called the Intercultural Speakers Bureau where we go out in panels with, um, with uh, uh, African-American, Asian-American, uh, uh, Latino, Latinx, and indigenous people and Jewish Americans go out together and talk about the history of bigotry, the, the formation of narratives about non-whites, uh, the racialization of people, the, uh, the uh, characteristics associated with each of these racial groups, white, brown, black, um, and how this becomes reinforced in, 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 in culture, particularly in American culture, in, in, uh, in uh, American society. Oh, thank you. And, um, and, uh, and then ways to, and then the impact that it has had on each of these communities in America and how to counter it together. So more and more, uh, we've become sort of, we, we now understand that we cannot work on our own issues without actually work, Islamophobia that is, without working across these uh, various communities. And so I would love to ally with you and, um, and make sure that you know about the work that we do. And we do dozens of these panels. We just did three of them for the city of San Jose and the people there loved it. The staff loved it because they learned a lot about this history. And I, and you know, and we end, we close by saying that this is an American problem. This isn't just a white mm -hmm. issue because within our own communities, we know that we experience colorism. We discriminate against each other. And it all comes from internalization, from, um, you know, having conditioned to, 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 to view certain groups a particular way. And so this is a, this is an effort that all Americans need to jump uh, on and, and to work together on. And, um, and I'd love to work with you. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this uh, email down. So sorry about being too long. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Betty. Susan? Thank you, thank you very much. I, I um, appreciated that um, presentation and I wanted to uh, draw attention to the preventative um, measures. And I think that um, it's, there's a pretty clear consensus that uh, education is really important, but I also want to draw attention to something that is much more difficult than education, but is very important in terms of hate crimes and bias crimes. I think that um, from the Japanese American community, we uh, recognize that uh, bias crimes are very long standing. It didn't just happen recently. They've been happening for decades, many decades. I just gave a presentation where I listed about 10 uh, national uh, uh, violent crimes against Asian Americans that happened in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. And um, one of the things that I think that we uh, need to remind ourselves is that scapegoating uh, uh, becomes exacerbated when there's an economic downturn. And I think that it's pretty clear that there are a lot of people who are out of work. There are a lot of people who are very stressed out by the pandemic. Um, some of the employment uh, issues are exacerbated by the pandemic. There's also an incredible number of people who are houseless. And we also have an incredible uh, 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 lack of resources for people with mental injuries, emotional, psychological, and mental health uh, problems. In Japantown, um, many of the incidents are have a 
uh, racist flavor to them, but a lot of them are committed by people who have fallen through the social safety net. And I just wanted to um, uh, reiterate uh, the recommendations that San Jose Nike Resistors made is to decriminalize those with mental injury, uh, provide adequate funding for counseling, addiction, medical services, and stable long-term housing. Um, this is a uh, very important. Uh, we can't forget uh, that, that there is a context for uh, ongoing uh, hate crimes as well as upsurge. Um, thank you. Susan, thanks for reminding us um, about the, the other presentations as well. And one thing that we will make sure we do is in addition to sending out um, the slides that Betty presented today, um, I just want to assure all of you that we'll share with our staff the reports that came from all of you, because I think one of the, you know, one of the hopes of this group is to really be able to deeply impact um, next steps for all of our public institutions. So we'll make sure that we sit down and do that as well. And I'll talk a little bit about follow up um, at the end. We. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. I actually wanted to hit on a couple of points. Uh, first is that, uh, you know, the, I think I really wanted to focus on the healing aspect of that presentation. Uh, it, that was actually very important. Um, the event that occurred at Grand Century Mall uh, was really open and it wasn't about uh, expressing um, just anger or, you know, or, or just calling for change but an opportunity for people in the community, for, for advocates and for others to really talk about how it was impacting them. Uh, that event, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, both able to be a part of it and, and, and uh, played a, you know, small, small role in, in helping to put it together. And uh, it was incredibly helpful for me. Um, the people who showed up uh, were very appreciative of a space like this because it allowed the folks, uh, the community-based organizations who who do a lot of this work on the ground, who get closer to the people in our communities when we have to, you know, when we have to kind of deal with these issues. Uh, it, it focused on us and our ability to, to maintain our own mental health and to uh, keep on doing this kind of work. So that kind of approach where, you know, the, the, um, our local government agencies can uplift and support the work of the CBOs, the people on the ground, um, I think it's a, a, a phenomenal approach. I don't want to call it novel, but I mean, I had never been a part of something like that uh, like before uh, that was really uh, supported and uplifted by the county. Uh, and honestly, I think if that we can continue creating that kind of partnership and relationship, um, it create the, the opportunity for these partnerships and working together, it continues to grow. And I think we can magnify our impact. Um, the other point I really wanted to point out was, and I really appreciate it about the presentation, was to really break down about uh, how racism and, and, and stereotypes plays in the, in the Asian American community, uh, because it has always been incredibly jarring for me to see that Asian Americans can be simultaneously seen as a threat uh, via the, you know, the, the foreigner or the perpetual stranger uh, uh, myth, and then at the same time seen as like the perpetual friend or pet through the model minority stereotype. It's kind of odd how we can occupy both spaces at the same time. Um, but it's also, it's also speaks to the complexities of how the uh, racism in, against Asian Americans um, has to be addressed. Um, and uh, you know, it's something for us to continue to, to, to uh, focus on as well as we continue to face uh, and address racism against all of the uh, communities of color. Thank you. Thanks, we, uh, Marianne, Dr. Dewan. Um, thank you, um, Supervisor Chavez. I, I want to um, thank you, um, Betty, for the very thorough um, presentation and for your leadership in this area and bringing voice to so many aspects um, of the issue. And also, thank you for sharing your personal uh, experience. Um, I want to just put a um, some emphasis on the comments that have already been made and avoid repeating them and just also recognize the importance of one of the things you shared around the bystander um, training and the opportunity for us to, in as many spaces as possible, uh, have this conversation uh, to combat racism and to help empower our community members, our colleagues, um, our residents um, with the tools that they need to combat um, these things when they see them happen in the spaces in which they live. Thank you. 
Thank you, Marianne. Dr. Huang, Kathy. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. And, um, you know, much of what I wanted to say has been said very eloquently by Susan in terms of the, the context, I think, of, of really um, how we're understanding and experiencing hate. We really also need to look at the relationships that we have and the conditions that are producing and exacerbating um, hate. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to um, to bring up was that I think that for, for our community, for the APIDA community, I, I think that it would be important, just as important in terms of bystander uh, training and empowering is really also support for leadership, public leadership development. So I think that there are in, you know, in Santa Clara County, many um, APIDA leaders who are in various positions, um, you know, working like Betty, Betty is doing. Um, but I think that there, it, there hasn't been the, the long, um, really, I think, in-depth strategic leadership, I think, that could happen um, that would really help so that there, there is a formal relationship between a leadership group and the various entities um, in the Santa Clara um, area. And I, I think that, you know, part of it is maybe because, you know, we're in this moment of um, great urgency, so people are stepping up. But my concern is, you know, when these incidents start diminishing, are we then going to lose that momentum? I think of a of a generation of leaders, and so I would, although I know I don't know if that's the purview necessarily of this group, but I would like to see some leadership development um, beyond some of the few programs like Apolly and other others that are that are here. So that's what I would um, think is important. So. Thank you. Um, and I I feel like almost everything's in our purview. So I'm going to go. Um, Supervisor Lee, I'm going to go to Dante and then to the public, and then I'm going to come back to you since this is your referral. Is that all right? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dante, and then I'll go to the public. Hello. Um, I was just going to say, uh, for me, I think a big part of it is um, the history that we teach in our K through 12 system. Um, and I think it perpetuates uh, a lot of the times um, some of this, this, this hate rhetoric, if you will, um, I just remember, I was just thinking, like, I just remember learning about Native Americans, learning about the Japanese Americans, and a lot of times we paint um, the picture that um, we're the enemy, like the minority in, in, in the history lesson, we're the enemy. And I think when we're talking about ethnic studies, I think in the summer, um, there was a small victory for a group in Eastside San Jose that were going to be able to get ethnic studies in some of the schools. Um, I think that needs to be a requirement for all kids that are um, educated within our communities is that they take uh, ethnic studies um, in the K through 12 system because I think that can also give perspective to the other side and really build community. A lot of times I think uh, me being in an interracial marriage, even my in-laws, um, having this narrative of what a black man is um, and, and it was really through the assimilation of um, really coming through the, 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 the um, citizenship um, process, right? And so I, I think um, we need to address those things, like education is important, but we really do need to make sure that all young people growing up in our communities um, have, you know, both sides of the coin and what the history is in this country, and, and also embracing culture and um, customs and traditions for, for all different groups. Thank you. Um, uh, Reverend Sakamoto, and then we'll go to the public and then we'll come back to the group. Thanks, Sante. Thank you. Well, I just wanted to kind of emphasize the education piece of it, but also the leadership uh, piece of it that was um, brought up earlier. Uh, you know, we, we're, it seems like we've been going through this for a very long time, and it's been really centuries when you look at how uh, discrimination, uh, a bias, um, uh, uh, way of seeing each other uh, has been a part of our history. And it's not just American history. If you look far back enough, it goes all the way back to uh, uh, various uh, ethnic groups, various uh, cultures, various times. And the leadership, I think, that is important uh, in this is when we, when we move on to the next thing, that we continue to be able to deepen our understanding of what needs to be done to uh, to correct the way that we see each other, uh, to allow ourselves to cultivate a mind that 
uh, sees each other as human beings, uh, not uh, in a way that would uh, pit uh, one group against another. Uh, we have had examples of this. Uh, I grew up in Hawaii. I never thought about it, but you know the way that the plantation workers uh, were uh, competed, made to compete against each other, uh, and the Luna, uh, who uh, was of another ethnic group, uh, controlled uh, how these uh, camps uh, would uh, engage each other, and, and so it, it goes. You know, it's a part of our history, our human being as human beings, and I think. Uh, the education is important, but in education, what is it that we teach uh, in that uh, education? And so the leadership, I think, really becomes so important. Uh, where do we, how do we continue to uh, navigate uh, these uh, challenges that we continue to come up against? Uh, we can look back at history, we can look at back at examples, but going forward, how do we address the source from which uh, these biases uh, emerge and how those biases affect all of us and are used to, uh, uh, for advantages uh, that, uh, that don't benefit uh, everyone uh, in our community. But just, just a couple of thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna go now to our public speakers and then I'll Hi. come back to the board. Nancy, I'll come back. I, I'd held them up for a while. I'll come right back to us. Thanks. That's fine. And, and again, sorry, I don't have the virtual. No problem. Voice. I just saw you and I, thank you. I'll come right back to you, Nancy. Our first speaker is Ritu Balani. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Okay. Um, Thank you to the chairs. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, and I wanted to echo um, everyone, what everyone's saying about. Thank you for um, Betty Duong's presentation. It was so comprehensive and I appreciate all the work that your office has put into it. Um, I actually had a question um, about for Betty about um, in the communication toolkit part uh, segment of the response plan for um, within your presentation, have you given any thought to any specific plans for um, pertinent to seniors because um, this is the population that is most vulnerable to um, the recent surge in attacks against the um, AAPI community. So I'm just wondering if you have given any thought in your plan to specific responses to seniors, um, any way to tailor um, responses to them so um, in a way that's separate from other age groups. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Irvish. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to mention about uh, two things. First is the part where the development, education, and the training, and the law enforcement bills that are required to be implemented. The second part is that about that what are the different type of a case that is being reported. As per the Jay Borowski's office, there has been a past 11 crimes, four involved with the race, six involved with the victims of the nationality, and one involved with the sexual orientation has been reported in last one month. Now, it is equally important to note that three of the nationally based crime were anti-Latino, two were anti-Asian, and one was from the Middle East. The racial based crime is the most cruel crimes that has been seen over the course within the United States of America. It has been on a noted on a numerous course that numerous movement that has been transpired in order to address such issue. Other than that, there has been the multiple occasion of a shootings that has been reported within the city of Milpitas as well at the Great Mall. Those shootings are associated with the hate crimes as well. As well as the as well as the different purpose of a robbery, and so with the end with the racism as well, it is important to note that even though with the education development training with the law enforcement, it is equally important to note down that that you know how each city has a set of a crime report that has been established and being reported to the county, and as well as what education law enforcement ordinances are being implemented within the city. For example, the city of Milpitas has implemented uh, a law enforcement not to 
shoot anybody until all the options are being exhausted. Such ordinances does help the city and county to improve over such situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go um, to Betty and then I'll go right to you, Nancy. So Betty, if you could just give a quick response. Uh, thank you, Cindy. Um, so yes, the communications toolkit, um, some of the uh, ideas that our team have come up with would include um, discussion guides um, that would be translated and of course culturally competent reflective of that particular community because it, you know this type of communication is so nuanced and specific to the history of each community. Um, so and yes, yeah, so that would include family discussion guides that includes your elders, discussion guides amongst you and your friends in, in and, and also how to intervene, um, take drawing lessons from bystander trainings, how to have those conversations with those you know, friends who make those type of comments or that type them, those type of jokes that belittle our identities. That's definitely one of the things that'll be, um, uh, one of the category of, of tools and resources that'll be included in the communications toolkit. Thank you so much for that feedback. I think we're right on, tar on aligned with um, the benefits of this and this will be a first iteration we envision something that'll be an iterative process to continue expanding and and and, and enhancing this um this resource we we I, I hope to see multiple toolkits issued over the years the multiple editions thanks betty and um just to do a time check with my colleagues i know that i have you all till two we had one more agenda item i want to go to Nancy, then to Greg, and then I'm going to turn it over to Otto to wrap this up. I, I hope we have enough time. We may not for our last item, which is to look at our name. So um, if I could go to, to uh, Nancy, then to Greg, and then to uh, Supervisor Lee. Uh, thank you. And I wanted to thank uh, uh, Ms. Duong for the presentation and for everybody who's made additional comments. And I also want to uh, highlight the Pyramid of Hate. It's a model that uh, we use uh, in our uh, education work. And frankly, anytime we're talking about uh, hate or bigotry, because uh, nobody is born hating, um, as you, it's something that you learn um, and you normally and you frequently learn it unconsciously. Um, so, and with that, and but just the way you learn it, you can also unlearn it, although that's more of a conscious process, obviously. Um, and so it just makes me think to myself uh, even more the importance and the the need to continually stress and implement as much as possible and broadly speaking anti-bias education um, in schools uh, K through 12 and also for um, educators and administrators um, to recognize their own biases, to learn how to, to recognize when they see bias acts and to learn how to be allies and intervene. So I just wanted to make sure that, that, um, uh, that that's I think part of the part of the pathway here, because if you can interrupt hate at the bottom level where most of us are, whether we've been targeted by it or nobody has uh, can, can claim to have not put their foot in their mouth at some point um, in their lives. But if you can get it at that level, you know, where, where the base is the strongest, it, you know, you don't go up to, to the higher levels of the, of the pyramid. I hope um, that wasn't the most articulate, but I hope the, I made that point. So I just wanted to emphasize that. And again, thank you for the pre presentation. Thank you, Nancy. Greg? Uh, Anti-disability hate crimes have been called the invisible hate crimes. Uh, they're, they're probably the least reported and uh, least paid attention to category of hate crimes. Um, it's uh, it, with many other categories and to a small extent with anti-disability hate crimes, there's a lot of overlap between the perpetrators, people who go after African-Americans, Jews, APIs, gays, uh, in some cases also go after people with disabilities, but much more so it's uh, um, others, people with uh, what in some cases uh, you couldn't even really call hate, but certainly is extreme forms of bias, including uh, sadism, uh, callousness um, against people with, with disabilities. Um, and I think there's a need for in any plan like this to call that out in particular. Uh, don't totally lump the uh, anti-disability hate crimes in with all the others because they are different in some ways and need to be taken uh, addressed uh, uh, particularly. Thank you for that. And I'm gonna turn to Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank our staff uh, uh, led by Betty Young for the good work uh, of this very comprehensive report. 
this effort is very much appreciated. It's certainly a very good start of a very important topic. As you can see, how many uh, folks have spoken today. Um, with that said, I do want to uh, say a couple of things. One is, um, uh, uh, as Betty mentioned about the rally that happened San Jose this Sunday, uh, Betty herself made a really impassionate speech. And for those who haven't seen it, I advise you to go take a look. She was awesome. Uh, but there's also a couple of uh, follow-up requests I would like to make uh, relates to this body of work that we've done. Uh, through the chair, I would like to uh, request that this report and the task force feedback on the report be incorporated into the administration's report back to, uh, on our referral on this item uh, at the May 4th uh, Board of Supervisors meeting to uh, inform the rest of our boards uh, for discussion. And also given the huge need for the resources in our community, to address the issues and the urgency of the time issue. I would like to also request that the administration come back with the supplemental information that can be considered at next Tuesday's board meeting uh, with a structure for resources that can be deployed immediately to address these gaps. Mm -hmm. This may include options for say many grants to community-based organizations that's already uh, doing this work on the ground itself, um, which I think would be extremely impactful. Thank you. Um, I, I just, uh, so thank you for that, um, Supervisor Lee. And let me just make a couple of observations and then um, and then recognize, I don't think we'll have time for our last item. So I just wanted to apologize to our colleagues at item eight, what I'd like to do is we'll start our next meeting with item eight. Is that all right with our my colleagues? Because I think the naming issue is good, but we want to make sure we don't rush through any of this. Um, a couple of things I'd like to say. One is, of course, uh, Betty, um, really, really good work and done very quickly. So thank you very much for that while you're also fighting COVID-19 and getting the VASC built. So good job. Um, one of the, um, one, one issue that I, I do wanna raise is that I think as we move these frameworks forward, we really do need to be um, inclusive. And I think the point that Greg raised about how we deal with the disabled community is just one example, but we need to, this needs to really be um, focused on not just anti-Asian hate, but like how are we dealing with this across the board? And I do really appreciate the other point that Greg raised, which is that particular communities are gonna need to be addressed in very specific ways. I thought like, for example, in the earlier presentation about hate crimes against vendors that are really vulnerable who are out, you know, um, uh, either selling ice cream or food is a really good example of, while we wanna be able to approach hate crimes in a writ large way, they're gonna be very, very, um, uh, or hate, uh, they're gonna be very, very specific strategies to deal with it, depending on what part of that hate pyramid that it's on and what community is being targeted in very particular ways. So, in addition to the point that um, Supervisor Lee raised, I really would like um, us to, as this gets presented to the board, to recognize that we've been really responding to a moment in time, but that moment in time also includes each community, our, our African-American brothers and sisters, you know, the LGBTQ community, the Latino community. And really even, you know, one of the things that I'm really struck by is that in some ways, I, I fear that the focus on one community reinforces actually what we're trying not to reinforce in terms of, of um, prioritizing the wounds of some over the wounds of others. And I think that's the opposite of what this movement, the, this moment in history calls for. Um, so, I, I, I think that the point, the other point that Supervisor Lee raised that I, I just also want to reinforce is that um, not unlike the way we've addressed other major issues in the county, that we do really need to think about the, um, the structural uh, needs of the institutions that will be lifting this up. Because, I, and just to, for all of you, what I mean by that is that right now, um, our whole department that is working on this issue is also in the EOC on the ground getting people vaccinated you know it's it's they're not sleeping right now um so both that we need to recognize that we're, we're going to probably that we're going to need to resource this and i think the point that supervisor lee raised about the options for resourcing and what that means and the kind of partnership we're going to have with our nonprofit uh, partners and our faith leaders i mean that there's a lot to um a lot to address um, in that. And so I, I agree, um, Supervisor Lee, that I think that should 
come back, you know, um, when the staff has get, gotten a chance to think a little bit about this and really, you know, I hope we can lift this up as part of our budget process as well. Um, you know, so, and I, and I know there's a lot of moving parts to it. So uh, I, um, I will reinforce that, uh, Supervisor Lee. I think um, the one last thing that I want to raise that I, I just, I, I, as I was listening to you, Betty, earlier, and I was in a meeting yesterday where we were um, talking about uh, sexual assault and we were listening to a victim, you know, talk about her family. The thing I was really struck by is that this is such an incredible opportunity for all of us to, to rethink our approach to each other as human beings. And that, um, and you know, and I'm, I see Dr. Smith here that I, I know that um, a lot of the changes that we're trying to make are really structural and systemic and will take some time and others we can move on right away. And so I also wanna just emphasize a point that auto raised that there may be some really quick things that we want to do, both to demonstrate our commitment to the public, but also to get the ball rolling. Um, and there may be some things that, that need to be layered in over time. Um, so anyway, I, I'm very excited about this. I think this was a great presentation. Uh, we, I don't believe we need to take a vote on this. I, I know we got a lot of information to receive the report, Kavita, but I'm going to just presume that the information that was shared today, the staff will take to the board on Tuesday. Because I see Dr. Smith, when Dr. Smith nods, everybody nods. There you go. <laughs> so um, with that, I, I do want to say a very special thank you to all of you. I, I want to do one reminder. I would be remiss if I didn't do this, which is go get vaccinated. If anybody in your family hasn't been vaccinated, we are open every day. It is a zero barrier. You can walk up, even if you don't have an appointment, you see a place to go get vaccinated, you tell people you're ready to get vaccinated, we are going to vaccinate them. Um, and so please, uh, we're also, if I could, I'm going to ask our staff to push out, um, along with the, the slides from Betty, if we could also push out the latest places that people can go to get vaccinated. We really, really need your help uh, doing that. So thank you, everyone. Have a blessed day. Beautiful. We got a lot of work done. I appreciate all of you. Please be safe. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Get your vaccination so you can hug your mother. All right. Be well, everybody. Thank, thank you, you, Supervisor. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye, all. Good job. Goodbye. Good job. And thanks, Otto and Betty. Wow. And Otto, this is gonna it's gonna be great. We're gonna do good things. Thank you so much, Cindy. Otto. Um, I just wanna we have a vaccination clinic happening tomorrow at James Lick High School. Free boba. Free boba, awesome, right? Okay. <laughs> and yeah. like, like within an hour of our social media promotion, three hundred likes, and like, it, it's 